101. So I want to get started with the Game Lab presentations this year. So for those of you not familiar with Game Lab or those of you online that are not familiar, um, this is a class in the second semester at FIA. So these guys go to school for four semesters, fall, spring, summer, fall. This is the spring semester, so this is their second semester. So they had a little bit of experience making games. And now they come into this class, and our, the target of this class is to learn to work with a subject matter expert, or an SME, to help guide a game-like experience, okay? So they learn how to make entertainment games. Now we're learning how to make games with a different kind of a purpose. And being guided from an SME is very different than being guided just for entertainment purposes. So that's the goal of the class, is to learn how to do that. And the goal of the projects were, was to create something here, whether it's a prototype, whether it's a final looking product, whether it was uh, work on an existing product. But the key, the key element that all the products have is, is that you're working tightly with a subject matter expert and they are giving you feedback throughout the process and you are refining your game mechanics and other aspects of the game to, for, for their needs. So you have a game designer working hand in hand with somebody that's not a game designer, but rather a, 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 an expert in the subject matter that they're trying to do. So we have eight projects this year of varying team sizes, um, and some VR, some not. We have four VR projects, four non-VR projects, and this is the first time we've, we've really had uh, significant VR stuff here. This will be the first time we're trying to do this in the bridge. We've, we've created an area over here that we think uh, will be conducive, so you'll be able to see the people, uh, the, the players actually playing the VR product, and uh, see the, the screen, so that will be what they are seeing inside of the headset, you'll be able to see that. Um, so without further ado, I'll leave it to the eight games, and we'll just, I've given the teams very strict guidelines to be on 15 minute intervals, so if you notice they're kind of rushing through it, believe me, each team could do probably 45 minute presentation on their game. So <laughs> cutting it down to 15 minutes means it's probably going to feel kind of rushed, maybe you'd have some questions. We likely won't have time for many questions in this format, but certainly they'll be around after and you could ask whatever you'd like. And you can certainly follow up with me later if you have, if you have other questions. So let's hit it. First team, VA, go. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Okay, okay. So as he mentioned, we're here to present a project we made in conjunction with the VHA regarding the two-step cleaning method. So the VHA realized they had a bit of a challenge, and that's that they have over 10,000 employees just doing sanitations and custodial work. And that's kind of hard to make sure they're all trained equally, especially across varying locations. So they came in contact with FIA in order to create some kind of prototype to help make sure everybody was being trained to a standard level. And that's where we came in. So the educational gaming department at the VHA reached out to us. We've been direct contact with Craig Porter mostly, but a whole team of wonderful people over there who have been working with us to create a proof of concept prototype for training the environmentals and sanitation workers. So they came directly to us with a list of goals that they wanted to achieve. Lots of good things to make sure that these workers can um, make sure the rooms are safe and clean for incoming veterans. In addition to the uh, standardized learning objectives that they created, we also came up with a few sort of experiential goals, things that we wanted to make sure that the players were getting from the game as, as a game and not just as a learning tool. So thanks to a huge swath of data about the sorts of people who would be playing our game, we were able to narrow down some specifics about what we thought would make for the best experience for them. We wanted to make sure primarily that this was a practical experience, that it reflected the real world situations that they would be part of, and that they could identify the things they've already learned in a real solid context. We wanted to make sure it was tactile. It didn't need to be abstract. It needed to be something that they could memorize on a physical level, memorize with visual cues, memorize with audio cues, and interact with. So we emphasized that point. And finally, it had to be reinforcement. This was a step in the training process after they'd had the on-site training, after they knew the basics. And we wanted to make sure that everybody reached the consistent level of quality work that the VHA was aiming for. So don't worry too much about all of this data. This is an example slide. One of the big priorities for our project was making sure at the end of it we had something that we could hand off. It wasn't just the project itself, which you'll see momentarily, but it also had to be a database behind it. Lots of information that was extensible and maintainable and documentation that future contractors could pick up and work from. So this is just an example of some of the things we were considering to make our feedback manager, which you'll see soon, much more extensible and understandable. But don't worry if this doesn't make a lot of sense out of context. So our first pass was, perhaps unsurprisingly, a little rough. We kind of naively assumed that, oh, this is a simple subject. I'm sure we'll do fine. But it turns out when you make that assumption, you're usually wrong. 
So our first pass had some things that stuck around that we liked. You see in the bottom left here our mentor character and our feedback system, which stuck around through the final product. Unfortunately, we made some assumptions that did not last very long. For example, it turns out there's much more to prepping a room than just cleaning up visible messes. So you'll see how we handled that problem shortly. Throughout the semester, a lot of our work came from the feedback we received. Not only were we in close contact with Craig Porter and the other SMEs within his department and within the VA, but we got a lot of feedback from the other people in our game web class and Tom Carbone. So some of the things that we were specifically interested in appropriating from that feedback is this idea that there's much more to a room and much more to prepping a room than just making it look nice. You also have to restock. You also have to make sure you're understanding the reasons behind your actions, those sorts of things. So those are things we made sure to incorporate. We're going to jump right into the gameplay demo right now. Rodrigo is going to go ahead and walk us through just a few steps of the uh, standard operating procedures, and we'll explain some of the decisions that we made and what that means for the final product. So if you'd go ahead. So for anybody who's not aware, the first and most important step in cleaning a room is making sure you're wearing the proper protective equipment. So he's going to go ahead and just grab the gloves, which is luckily all he needs right here. He's going to take a look around, survey the room, understand what needs to be done in any given scene, and select the appropriate equipment from his inventory. This was designed with mobile and web in mind, so we made sure to include a physical scrubbing motion to help reinforce that behavior. And of course, because of the importance of the two-step cleaning method, the mentor pops up and reminds him he has to disinfect the surface as well as clean it. So in real life, there's a certain amount of wait time that you have before a product reaches full effectiveness. We didn't want to make the player sit through that, so using our dwell timer system, he can fast forward a little bit of time and make sure the product dwells like it's supposed to. He doesn't necessarily know the product's dwell time offhand, but just like in real life, he could check the manufacturer's label. All right, go ahead and proceed through the next few steps for us. Of course, the mentor provides consistent feedback. You can go ahead and move on. So one of the pieces of feedback that we did get through the semester is uh, a list of the common sorts of mistakes that employees make in this position. And we wanted to represent as many of them as we could. Um, one example of that is some employees don't understand the difference between the biohazard procedures and normal clean procedures. So here we've given just one example of the difference between a biohazard container and normal trash. Unfortunately, Rodrigo has made the same mistake, so. Sorry about that. So unfortunately here, Rodrigo has made the same mistake that some environmental employees do and has been reminded there is a difference between the biohazard and normal containers. And as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to prioritize showing a lot of the other preparation work that employees need to do to make sure the room is safe and clean for incoming veterans. So in addition to cleaning, we've added plenty of functionality, for example, restocking a bathroom that just has other interactions they may need to know. We could walk you through all 18 steps of the standard operating procedures, but we've got a couple other things we want to show you. So we're going to go ahead and step out of the demo for right now. So one of the things that we wanted to focus on is uh, coming up with exactly what we took from this, kind of self-reflectively looking back on the project and figuring out exactly what lessons we've learned. So we went ahead and made a short video talking about some of the things each of us took away from this project. So we'll go ahead and play that for you now. So the biggest difference for me was SME priorities don't on? match up with what I would have initially expected. Going into more depth with the SMEs, we, we realized that even these really seemingly simple subjects can have lots of ways to get them wrong, but also a surprising amount to learn from them. Uh, so for me personally, um, I really like working with an SME. It's an extra sort of constraint that you put on yourself. Um, I feel it's a much more realistic approach to designing a game. This is like real people who have like real intentions with what they want out of this application or you know game for example. And to me that's like a really good experience. Um, I think working with SME is like definitely really valuable. With the SME was just that idea of marrying two different worlds. You know the SMEs know nothing about game design 
uh, and we know nothing about the subject matter, but we still have to make find a way to make the, the project work. Working on a project like this is interesting because you pivot a lot. Uh, depending upon what the SME needs or what the SME uh, requires, you might have to change an entire system you know, from week to week to just to make it better so that you can actually hit those goals, hit those targets. I did a lot of um, uh, UI icons using Illustrator. It was very uh, sort of practical focused. Uh, I was using a lot of real world reference it was less about you know trying to be unique, trying to be entertaining, trying to be sort of exaggerated, but more about um, trying to depicting something realistically, um, uh, trying to you know improve readability, improve clarity. For this project, we actually had to go to the VA hospital to take reference pictures, so we can base all of the models on all of the assets specifically on a VA hospital room. So that way it would be easier for the people that would use the application to uh, feel familiar with the items themselves. Okay, so just to briefly introduce you to the team behind this product. You can ignore that first guy, he didn't do anything. Um, but our beautiful artists, Francisco and Noel, who did all of the artwork that you saw in the game. Our designers, Jackson and Corey, who laid out a lot of the mechanics, the feedback, the UX that you just witnessed. And finally, our tech producers, Joel, Rodrigo, and Jarek, who made all of the mechanics and implemented everything that we needed. It was a wonderful team to work with, and I'm very happy with the product we made. Now, before I let you guys go, uh, our SME team would like to say a few words. I'd like to introduce the Associate Director of the Educational Program, Leslie DeVoe. purpose for being here is just to thank you guys for the fabulous work they've done. And frankly, when we first introduced the topic, we didn't think that you guys who are eventually going to be working on Star Wars, the next Star Wars movie or the next um, whatever game that has come up. Um, <laughs> I had a whole list in my head and it's all gone. Um, that you wouldn't be interested in a game for janitors. So we really appreciate that you have been interested in helping us. And I can tell you that they have had, a, the, the team itself has had an effect on us and the VA. We've developed about 10 small games, educational games in the last couple of years. And we do have some struggles with finding funding to go forward with things. But we, had, we used the pre-pre-alpha that Chris and the team developed. And we've managed to find some funding to carry it further on. And we will be making this game for the 10,000 plus um, environmental specialists in the VHA and in the near future. And the other thing that's convinced me that we need to hire an intern from a, an institution like this. So we're going to do that in the next six months or so. Thank you again. Thank you to Eric Sand for hooking us up with Tom. And thank you very much for, for providing this fabulous product. Thank you. All right, thank you guys very much for your time. We'll go ahead and let the next team get set up.
Hi guys, uh, I'm Hannah, this is Jake. We are here to talk to you about Project Oz, A Heart of Ten, a uh, game for depression support. So, um, first I just want to give a brief overview. We are one of the larger teams here. Uh, we have three producers, two programmers, and seven artists, so you're going to see some really high quality art coming up here. Um, so basically where we came from, Project Oz started last semester in the fall as an art project for the art track here at FIA. Um, it was presented as taking um, The Wizard of Oz and putting it in Tim Burton style and making a virtual reality experience. Um, they didn't get super duper far, but they had a whole bunch of models made. So at the beginning of this semester, one of the art faculty, Chris Rhoda, came to us and was like, hey, we have all this really cool art. We want to do something with it, but we're not sure what to do with it. So a couple of us were talking. We wanted to make a game that taught people how to support those with depression. And we thought that The Wizard of Oz would be a perfect environment for that. Firstly, because of the virtual reality, we were able to play with the actual physicality of the space, and actually being able to be next to and talk to characters really helps simulate that support. Um, in addition, because our audience was actually the supporters of those with depression, and depression already affects a wide span from teenagers to the elderly, um, those support networks can be friends, family, parents, grandparents, anything. So we needed to use something that was a little more timeless as our fictional wrapper, and The Wizard of Oz was perfect for that. And because it's such a big world, we can use it as a more extensible project. So we're focusing on depression in the Tin Man. But in the future, other illnesses such as anxiety could be used to be paired with the Cowardly Lion and so on and so forth, which makes this perfect in case someone wants to pick it up for uh, Fi Ventures or something else in the future. Um, so how, how our game works is it's if you've ever played a Telltale game, it's very similar to that. You are presented with these characters, you talk to them, you have different responses, and how you respond will change the story just a little bit from uh, one point to another. Um, so we use this to track uh, the support that the players were providing to the characters. Some of the options that they would be provided with would be very effective and really help the Tin Man, whereas others wouldn't be so helpful. We track this with support points, but we never actually show the support points to the player. Instead, we actually use the world saturation. As you can see in this picture, it's very desaturated. It's very gray and brown. Um, when you start the game, it's all bright and vibrant. But when you meet the Tin Man, you really go into his perspective. And you see the world as this kind of gray, blah, not as exciting place. And as you give him better and better support, he starts to see the color in the world, and you do too. Um, and then we also use this to provide feedback to the player at the end of the game so they can see how they've done. So to make sure that we had some fidelity with our information that we were presenting, um, we had two uh, subject matter experts. The first is Dr. Suzanne James. She has a master's of education in counseling psychology and a doctorate in psychology. She's a family therapist, so she works with people with depression and those that support those with depression, like the parents. So she was a perfect resource to not only tell us about support methods, but also how to characterize depression in a proper way. However, she is a full-time therapist, so we also <laughs> used um, Mr. Akeem Ray. He is actually graduating this weekend uh, to get his master's of communal psychology at FAMU, and he already had a bachelor's of psychology. Um, this semester, he was also interning at uh, public schools and counseling students in order to help them with depression and help them help their friends. So he was really involved with that subject already. Um, and because he was young, some of his feedback was a little more tailored to uh, the game lens rather than just straight up psychology. So I want to give you some of the feedback that we got. Um, we had a lot of emails going back and forth, um, lots of sending videos, pictures, uh, scripts, everything. So some of the things that we had to change, um, on the left here you can see that the Tin Man is very Tim Burton-y because this is the original concept art. We had to, it was too weird uh, according to our SMEs, so we had to kind of make it a little more normal looking, make him a little more likable. Um, some other things that we changed, we added a lot of detailed environmental storytelling. We had to make sure there was grime on the dishes and uh, scratches in the furniture and things like that to show the neglect that comes with um, when you have depression. You don't necessarily have the energy to clean all the time. So we wanted to show that and kind of bring the world to life a little bit more. Other things we changed, um, we had more diverse activities. Rather than just talking, they wanted to emphasize how action is important. Um, so we would do things like play the drums to remind the Tin Man that he used to love music, or to clean up his house so that he felt a little bit better and could tackle things a little bit at a time. Um, another thing that they had us track was um, instead of just the support points using um, the responses, we also use things such as that physical presence in the VR. If you stay near the Tin Man and don't say anything or look at him, he'll say something different. 
And then lastly, the other thing that we wanted to uh, change was we divided our support into different types. And you'll see more of this um, when we do the demo. But uh, each support type has a different characteristic. So maybe it's environmental help or medical help. By doing this, we were able to give more detailed feedback. And so that was really helpful to the players. And also the SMEs really liked that. So since they couldn't be here today, um, I wanted to just give you some of the things that they said. Um, Dr. James, was she really liked the feedback, and um, she just loved the project overall. Mr. Ray uh, said, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you all on this game. All of the ideas and creative direction have been spot on. As a psychologist, I think it is extremely important to reach and understand how depression not only affects the diagnosed individual, but everyone that interacts with those in with clinical depression. You all have been very easy to work with and very open to critique. Keep up the great work. So I want to thank them. Even though they're not here, I want to thank them for their contributions. They were excellent. So if you want to learn more, we do have a game design document that I can provide to you if you're interested. We also have um, our website up on there. Um, so we can check that out. But I would like to get to the demonstration because it is a big game. We're only going to show a part of it, but I'd like to show you what we have. Oh, <laughs> my bad. Yeah, I know. Okay. So we just want to show you a small segment of the game. Um, so we're just. This is about in the middle of the game where the Tin Man finally comes outside. Hey, Mr. Tin Man, I found your axe. You should come out here. Mr. Tin Man, you finally came out. Hi. Uh, yeah. It's been a while, I guess, hasn't it? Yeah, I didn't know if we'd see you anymore. Oh, but wait, I have something to tell you. I found your axe. Oh, you did? Where is it? Over the horse. But I said so. Oh. <laughs> but I bet you can get it out. Come on. Well, I can't let him down. Let's see how bad it is. see you out here again. I see you found your axe. Yeah, but what good does that do? I think it might be stuck in there for good. Well, that's not true, Mr. Tin Man. You're the strongest guy in Alloy Village. No, in all of Oz. I know you can get it out. I think you're giving me a little too much credit. Copper Kid <laughs> does like to exaggerate. But I do think that if anyone could get your axe out, it's you. Besides, we can help you if you want us to. Oh no. I couldn't ask you guys to do that. So here we have an example of one of the choices that you can make. Um, so the player can choose whether they want to help the Tin Man or encourage him to try it on his own. Um, we're going to help him. <laughs> Are you sure? You did it! See? We knew you could do it. You shouldn't doubt yourself like that. You're very good at what you do. Thanks, guys. I guess you were right. I just had to give it a try. But I don't know if I would have been able to get it out without all of your help. Now that you have your axe, are you going to go clear the yellow brick road? I was going to go to the Emerald City and get you a new one before we found the old one. 
but I couldn't get there. It would be nice to have the path clear again. I miss all the visitors, don't you? Yeah. But first I think I need a break. Oh, of course. I just can't help but think that it'd be nice to be able to travel from here to the Emerald City again. I would love to visit the Wizard of Oz sometime. That's why I was going to ask for a new axe. I heard the wizard will give you anything you need. That's right. He'll do more than just give you things. He's great just to talk to, and will help you in any way he can. It might be a good idea for all of us to visit the wizard at least once in our lives. Hmm. That might not be a bad idea. But before I do anything, I need to think about some things. If we clear the road, then maybe the Tin Man could go see the wizard and get happy again? Hey, Copper Kid, how about we go see if there's something we can do about those trees ourselves? I'm sure the Tin Man is tired from getting his axe back, and we should give him some time. Here we go again, with giving him some time. I know I asked this before, but why are you sticking with me? I'm such a downer. This can't be any fun for you. You hardly know me, and yet you're talking to me way more than anyone else. And everyone else is so much more interesting than I am. <laughs> really? Why on earth? Well... Thanks, anyway. I guess I could tell you a little bit about what's going on. I just... I've been feeling really left out lately. I mean, I'm the one that created Alloy Village in the first place, so people like me would have a place to belong. Don't get me wrong, it's been really great. All sorts of people with families and friends have shown up, and the town gets really lively when everyone's out and about. I guess I just noticed that. It seems like everyone has someone but me. I used to have someone too, back before I was turned into tin. But now that I'm made of metal, no normal person could ever love me. And all of the other metal people already have someone to care about. My heart is just like the rest of me. Broken and made of tin. I might as well not have one at all. Sorry. I shouldn't talk your ear off like that. Anyway, I should be clearing the yellow brick road, right? Right this way. Alright, so there's a little bit more to the game and there's a lot before it as well, but I do want to show you the end. Um, so when you beat the game, or when you get to the end of the game, you are presented with one of three endings based on how well you performed overall. And then you're also given your book and you can look in it to see different the different support types. So in this example, since we skipped around a little bit, um, we did pretty well with disclosure because we let the Tin Man talk his whole thing out. So we'll look at that. And it does give some specialized um, feedback on that. It's a lot easier to read than the helmet. Um, but it does, since we did about a middle of the road job with the disclosure in particular, it does give you a couple hints on what you could try to do, but also tells you what you did correctly. Um, another example, hobbies, we didn't really get a chance to do that. So if you uh, click on hobbies, it tells you, you know, hey, you should try to figure out what the Tin Man liked. And maybe you could do that the next time you come and visit, and maybe that'll help him a little bit better. So this feedback allows them to try these things out in a safe environment, so that way they don't have to um, try some support techniques that may not be very effective with real people. So uh, that's everything we have. So thank you guys. And I want to thank our voice actors since they are here. It was uh, Eric, Jarek, and Kay. So thank you guys a lot. <laughs>
No? All right. Greetings, everybody. My name is Eric, and we are Team Buttersell. So, <laughs> and we wanted to present you with a game we call Protoverse. So, when we first started Game Lab class, we thought to ourselves, and we wanted to make a game that taught cellular biology to students. We decided to make an action adventure game, or at least we began with a different concept, and we ended up creating an action adventure game with the purpose of educating middle school STEM students who are taking biology class. What we wanted to do was teach them biology on a desktop platform, and we wanted our game to be a supplement to what they learned in class. So some of the goals for our game were to teach cellular biology using space as a fictional wrapper, something completely different than what they're used to in class. We wanted to take the names that they're used to, the names that they're being forced to learn in class, and give it something more interesting to have more of a better appeal. So we introduced different space-themed names. Our subject matter expertise is a actual teacher. He works at Young Middle Magnet School, and he teaches middle school biology classes. We contacted him, and he was very helpful with our initial design and helping us laying the groundwork for deciding on what we wanted to do and how to implement this game to appeal to students. He made very, very strong contributions in giving us insights on what the students really liked outside of class, not just what they were interested in our class. So for a rundown of the game, we're going to show you one of the levels, but we wanted to give you an overview of how we decided to design this game. We started off with a basic approach. For our first level, we wanted to teach the fundamentals of the game itself and then ease our way into the educational content. So for level one, we began introducing basic gameplay of movement controls. The centrosome is one of the fundamental objects of a cell. We taught them that basic movement, controlling where you go, is tied to this centrosome. Next. We also added in resource collection. And we took the concepts of what glucose, ATP, amino acids, and all the other fundamentals that are required for cells to operate. And we took them and gamified them. Next, we focused on the building and the construction. Like any action game or construction games, you have to have certain things in place. So we gave them a context menu that allowed them to see the objects that were selected, the health. It gave a description of it, and then it showed things that it can do. And we also wanted to introduce the concept of ship repair, because like every cell, it has a way of repairing itself. So we added these different functions into the game for level one. For level two, we wanted to focus more on energy manipulation and energy production. So we focused on what we know as the mitochondria. They tell you in class, it is the powerhouse of the cell. So we made it a generator. But with all energy production, there is byproducts, there is waste. So we figure a way to make the students understand is by generating waste. As we know in the technical terms as free radicals, we began moving into peroxisomes, which are the cell's way of cleaning up the cell. The peroxisomes basically remove the waste from the game, and it cleans up the cell. So for our third level, we wanted to introduce the concept of combat because it's not going to be a fun game if you can't fight something. So we wanted to make bacteria and viruses a concept and a main focus of our third level. We introduced the Golgi body, which is a recycling plant in the game, and we taught of how it works. Then we introduced slicers. Slicers are the natural way of taking out anything that is hostile to the cell, and this is the player's main way of defending themselves as well as the lysosomes, 
which are used in very many ways, but for the concept of this game, we decided to focus them as defensive or salvagers to help take out foreign threats. Our two enemies you can see are the viral RNA, which attack the cell, or in the game it attacks the spaceship and damages the nucleus, as well as bacteria, which also infiltrate the cell and damage. So we also wanted to add in because we can't forget the educational aspect. So what we decided to do was we took the game and added missions and quests. And through these missions and quests, you interact with different types of aliens in space. These aliens are essentially the teachers. And instead of talking in game terms, they use the space terms and they translate them over into the biological terms, having the correlation between what is real in the game and what is real in biology. So for our SME, we sent him weekly builds of the game. Every week we sent him a new build, we showed him art, we kept in contact, even though as a teacher he was busy a lot when it came to his own students. So we are very thankful he made time to be able to communicate with us on a consistent basis. And he told us that he really liked the encyclopedia because it was a way for you to relate. You can go any time in the game and go through the encyclopedia and you'll be able to see just what each and every object in the game is, the real name of it, and what it does, just in case you need a little help. He also gave us the concept of adding quizzes in the game, but we took this and we added a unique spin because we didn't want to be the typical educational game, which is basically a textbook that looks like a video game. So that's why we developed a questing system to kind of reinforce what we're learning in the game. Mm -hmm. So now we want to show you a game demo. How's the volume, guys? Uh, actually, it's probably going to be a little bit louder.
our demo so thank you very much we have about four producers which are Paul we have myself, we have Scott, who cannot be here today. We have Kayla as well, and Ed, who is our technical designer who worked closely with the programmers. Paul and Kayla worked very hard on the level design along with Scott, and they helped us out a lot when it came to making sure we had good levels that were interesting. Our programmers, we have Justin, Sid, Jennifer, and Grover who worked very hard to make sure we had a very feasible and playable game, which was... And then, can't forget Lindsay, who provided us with this awesome art that you saw. So, thank you very much. My name is Brandon Kidwell, and I'm going to present our game today, uh, Why Did Bobby Aga Take My Brother? Um, for this game, we had uh, a VR game, and so I'll go over exactly what our game is. And so uh, there's three core concepts for our game, the folklore, uh, the empathy, and the research. 
And so first I'll talk about the folklore a little bit. The idea here is um, we wanted to introduce uh, Russian folklore about Baba Yaga. Um, and our SME is the one that presented this, presented this to us and wanted us to use this. Um, and Baba Yaga is kind of like uh, our, our, kind of like our witch. Um, and so what we wanted to do is introduce this to children. And it's similar to a grim fairy tale. Uh, usually it's a little, little dark, but in this case, we wanted it to be a little bit lighter. Um, and so we made a much lighter toned uh, theme of this. And so I'll go into these other two as we move forward. So first, I, what I wanted to do is uh, introduce our SME Ekaterina, and she'll be able to talk a little bit. Hello. Uh, I'm a PhD student in University of Florida, and uh, this project is a base, it's a core base of my research, actually. Uh, and my focus uh, in my research is developing uh, empathy in young children, uh, and uh, a lot of literature about using fairy tales and role play uh, as a um, very good technique to develop empathy. And uh, my research dream uh, was to use virtual reality to bring this fairy tale experience and role play experience uh, into uh, learning for, for young children. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, next, I just wanted to branch right into our team real quick. Uh, so we had 14 people, and then a special thanks to Will Perez as a 15th person. He helped with some of our animation. Um, and then I just wanted to point out that our project was a four-month project. And we built this game from the ground up. Um, and we were able to create over 30 environmental assets and character assets. Uh, we had over 15 character animations. And we had over 70 voice lines, because we had to record multiple times for each character. All right, so the next thing I want to go through real quick is just uh, basic game flow, um, just general overview. We'll show you the actual game, but we won't be able to show you all of it, because there actually is a, quite a bit of content to, to play through. Um, so our player's goal is primarily to figure out who took your brother and why. So in the beginning, our inciting incident is our brother's taken. And so now we need to go figure out why that is. Uh, and so to do this, we can explore locations and we can interact with characters. And so we start off at our family home, and then we move to the forest, which from that point we can branch uh, to, to go to Baba Yaga and the swan geese, the older sister or the younger sister. And these are set up to be very basic and low level because children are our target, our target audience, and so we want to make sure it's not too difficult. They're not here to explore for a reason we would explore. They're here to just be here in the environment and see if they can learn from this environment. And so the next thing is our interactions, and that's questions, memories, and perspectives. So I can go into this a little more detail. So we have right here some of our characters, our angry Baba Yaga, and then her sisters, which one is happy and one is sad. And then we also have our mouse character, who acts as a mentor. And so on the right, we can see a question bubble, a memory on the bottom left, and on the right is perspective. And all of the empathy characters that you can interact with will have these next to them. And so in our demo, we will briefly show a little more of how these interactions actually occur. And so the last little bit um, is our modular development. And so when Ekaterina came to us, one of the things that she wanted to do with her research is that she wanted to be able to uh, make changes on the fly. So if, the, carrot, so if the, 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 the experiment was supposed to be just let the children go through it and experience it, good. And then if she wanted to say, I want to turn off a character, and I want to see what happens, and if the children can come to the same conclusion without a character there, she can do that. Um, and we also integrated Yarn, which is a tool here you see in the middle. That allows us to create the dialogue flow, and it allows us to assign where in the audio plays and how it plays, and then our questions that will appear. Um, and then on the left, uh, we have a little example of how an empathy character is set up, and we can build more empathy characters from this template. And then, um, uh, similar to a previous VR game with the Tin Man, uh, we were kind of going more towards this Telltale type game. And so um, before I go to the demo, uh, I have a last little bit from Ekaterina to just talk a little more about her research. Yeah, sure. So this game is, is done. Uh, uh, but for me, my work is just starting at this point because I'm going to use this game a lot. Uh, and uh, this summer, actually, I'm starting from May. Uh, and I'll go to school in Gainesville. And I will work with the children. And I will collect a lot of data and do research on the base of that. Because all each single feature and memory and perspective were in the game, not just for nothing. It was all based on some literature and some something. So uh, at uh, at this point, my job is to figure out whether it works actually in a VR environment with games 
with the children or not, whether it teaches them or not. It's a lot of questions, a lot of work, and I'm very excited about that. To be done, and yeah, I'm very thankful that it exists, this game, and yeah. All right. So then we will move to our demonstration. All right, let me know when you're ready, Krishna. You ready? Yep. All right. So I'm going to let Krishna play a little bit, but I'll chime in uh, when it when it comes time. Volume. Your mother and I are going to the market. Make sure to watch your brother. Look, a butterfly. See if you can catch it, but be quick before it gets away. Oh no! Those swankies just flew off with your brother! Where are they taking him? What should we do? So each location has signposts that will allow the child to navigate around the world. And so we're going to go to Baba Yaga's place right off the bat. Look! There are the geese that took your brother. We should go find out where he is. So this is an example of our empathy characters. And so real quick, he'll go over the uh, questions. Tell me where my brother is. Is my brother here? And he can grab these and drag Have them into the brother? character to ask the question. Is Quack. my brother here? You should leave this place, Quack. Is my brother here? And now he's asked several questions. He's been able to unlock oh, the memories and perspective. He's trapped in Bobby Agas' house. But don't go over there. Bobby Agas is very dangerous, Quack. And now he's able to look through the perspective of the geese. And so the geese are small, and they see Bobby Agas as this giant, scary old <coughs> lady. And so we can put on their perspective and see through their eyes. And then if we turn them off, we can then see from our perspective again. So it allows the children to kind of get an idea of what this character is seeing. The next thing on top is the memories. And so this is just a brief storybook kind of element. So he'll play it real quick. Many years ago, I was a human just like you. We all lived in a small village along with Bobby Aga and her family. Bobby Aga was my best friend. Quack. One summer, I went traveling with my father. All right, I we'll cut it there. If you want to see it, you'll have to play the rest of it. But... The next thing we want to show you real quick is, uh, why don't you go over there and, and see if anyone's in that house? What are you doing here? Go away! There's nothing for you here! Tell me where my brother is. Is my brother here? Tell me where my brother is. You are making me angry. I don't want to talk to you. Go away. All right, so we're going to cut that there real quick. Now what we're going to show you one last thing is that we have our little tool here. So if the researcher wanted to go in and say we want to make the swan geese change their voice intonation, I can come in here and I can change that. And now what, what this means is I've just changed it so that the geese are not going to be as emotive. They'll still have their animations and emote, but they will sound kind of dull. They'll be like, oh, okay. So he's going to run through this real quick again. Uh, he may move a little bit faster so we can get there faster. Uh, but the main, the primary thing that happens here is it, it's a way to see if the child picks up on the fact the that the person is just being emotive sure or if the person is picking up on their actual voice. So you can kind of play around with like, how is the child actually understanding and building that empathy with the character? We also have plenty of throwable objects because we know that children love to throw things, so we gave them plenty of things to throw in the game. <clears throat> Look, a butterfly. See if you can catch it, but be quick before Get it back out. Oh no, those swan keys just flew off with your brother. Taking him. What should we do?
Look, there are the geese that took your brother. Okay, he's going to go to the you second question. So he he's going to ask the first one, which is just kind of a, a fearful response. Is my brother here? Where did you take my brother? What? Well, he's trapped in Bobby Agat's house. But don't go over there. Bobby Agat is very dangerous. Quack. So that's basically, uh, basically it. So, and that's it. Thank you. I'll be presenting Little Turtle Learning Tools for you guys. So first off, I would like to introduce our team. And our team consisted of four programmers, Evan, Dale, Carson, and Travis, who is right next to me. Uh, we have two artists, Boo and Chelsea. And I am the only producer, along with our lovely narrator, Hannah, who was presenting Oz earlier for you today. We have two SMEs, or subject matter experts. Uh, one is Janetta Bryant, and she is an owner of Little Turtle Learning Tools. Uh, she has a child with special needs. And we also have Emma Bachman, who is a teacher who had a master's in education uh, for special needs. Now, Janetta and Emma came to the Game Lab with a kind of a different project. And basically, the common thing that they have is that uh, they have a child with special needs where they deal with kids with special needs, and more particularly, autism. So with that, they wanted to create a company, and they created, created Little Turtle Learning Tools. And with that, they basically looked at the market, and they said that all of these apps that teach children well are kind of one-dimensional, and they only teach one subject. So they may only teach writing, or they may only teach reading, or math. And they don't do something that's multi-dimensional. So what we've done is help them create a more multi-dimensional app. So what is Little Turtle Learning Tools? Well, what it is is a mobile game built for iOS and Android. And it is supposed to be made for the classroom and then later on integrated into a home setting. So we used Unity Engine 5.5. And again, it's targeted at children with special needs or autism. And it's for children with autism through the ages of 3 and 7 and kids with special needs from 5 and up. So this app isn't only a game, but it was made to be a learning tool. Uh, it's supposed to be go coinciding with their curriculum and to go alongside with how they study and how they learn. So it's not only a game, uh, it is a tool for them to learn and educate themselves. Uh, that also kind of ties into how uh, kids with autism learn. So kids with autism and anybody with autism, to treat it, it needs to be caught very early on during these ages. So this is the best time, and this is why we're targeting this demographic, uh, because this is when they need the help the most. So what makes Little Turtle Learning Tools a little bit different from a normal educational game? Well, again, it's a learning tool. So all of the designs and all of the scenes and all the levels are made and concepted off of how uh, standardized learning is in the classroom. So the concepts of how they learn with uh, counting, for example, so the ice cubes are set up in a fashion that's one through five and then six through 10 in two rows. And that's exactly how they learn. They learn one through five in consecutive order from the top row to the bottom row, from left to right. And for an example, in one of our worlds that we created, uh, if 
we were able, if we made it so that the children can put the ice cube in any order, it kind of contradicts the purpose. And that's not how, exactly how they learn. So we're trying to reinforce how the children learn in school with this app. So we also want it that fun doesn't detract from education. So this app can't be overly fun. We can't have things that you pick up and you throw all the way across the screen because it's not what they're there to do. They're not there to play, it's there to learn. Uh, so we also need to, that goes back to taking into account our target audience. Uh, it's children with special needs. So children with special needs can learn from normal apps, but I'm sorry, the other way around. So normal kids cannot learn, normal kids can learn from special needs apps but kids with special needs cannot learn from normal education apps. And one of those things, or one of those reasons why, is because of no failure and only resetting. So in a normal game, they're able to put something wrong into a slot, say a circle into a square. It'll give them a negative feedback noise and it'll tell them that they're wrong. What people with special needs need is that it needs to be reset. So you put the circle into the square and there's no negative reinforcement the circle simply moves back to the position that it started in. So it's just a reset, you're not failing. It's only resetting and you're only trying again. So with that, uh, this project was very different from the very beginning in terms of subject matter experts. And that's really because the project and the design and the core was made at the very beginning. Uh, we were given a world with eight levels, which is the green, and it was completely inanimate. So it wasn't very fun for kids with special needs or kids at all. And what we did was we took that content and we built it up. Uh, we expanded into 10 worlds from the one, so we have 80 levels from the eight. Uh, also with our SME, we interacted with them weekly. So every week we met with them online and sometimes in person. And also we made weekly builds for them which gave us feedback. So with them giving us the feedback, we were able to iterate immediately onto the content and give it back to them so they can test it because it's very important. So in each of the worlds, uh, they will have a home world, math readiness, spelling, shape, handwriting, pattern, math, puzzle, and matching. And these are the subjects uh, that they learn in these worlds. Each world has a different color and they're different thematically, but it's all to help reinforce. So again with the feedback, uh, we iterate all the time and every single week we do. And these are just some examples of things that we've iterated on. So. At first, we had just kind of boring spelling and the lobster with the L had no bubbles. And we found that that wasn't very fun for them. So what we wanted to do was make sure that they take these bubbles and take these letters and we made it more fun. Uh, we also added particle effects and animations to help the whole game just feel a lot better for a child. And it helps keep them uh, attentive to the project. Another thing that we added was that, so every time you go into a world, a, a, everything is narrated. So all the instructions are said to you uh, by our narrator, along with the fact that's given into the world. So if you were to go into the world with a lobster, uh, you would get narrated, oh, please spell the word lobster. But then you'll also get a fact about the lobster after. And that also helps children uh, learn. So with that, I'm going to have Travis here demo the game. Uh, we're going to be going through the red world and we'll be going through each subject. Choose a color world. Let's go on an adventure. Choose a game. Red is a primary color. Trace the letters to spell the word crab. Crabs typically walk sideways. Fantastic! 
fantastic! Choose a game. Red is a primary color. Tap the flip-flops to match the same style. Flip-flops have been around for more than 6,000 years. Excellent! Choose a game. Red is a primary color. Spell the word lobster. Lobsters live up to an estimated 45 to 50 years in the wild. L L O O B B S S T T E E R R Yay! Choose a game. Red is a primary color. Move the beach towels to complete the pattern. Towels didn't become affordable until the 19th century with the cotton trade and industrialization. Yay! Choose a game. Red is a primary color. Trace the octagon umbrella along the dotted line. The first umbrella was made more than 2,000 years ago. Yay! Choose a game. Red is a primary color. Count down from 10. A beach ball is an inflatable ball for beach and water games. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Excellent. Choose a game. Place the numbers in order. What comes before and after. Life rings are designed to be thrown to a person in the water to prevent drowning. Good job! Choose a game. Complete the puzzle to create a lifeguard stand. Fantastic! Choose a game. Red is a primary color. So with that, that is a whole world. And basically it's the same thing on every world where math and math readiness will differ. Uh, each colored world, like the green, instead of a lifeguard stand, you'll be creating a parrot. And um, overall, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the class. Uh, hopefully this app will be on the market to help a child one day. And a quick note from our SMEs to the whole class. Um, so here it is from Janetta and Emma. And Janetta says, Tom and the students of Game Lab, Thank you for allowing us to be part of your class. So at the end of the presentation, they also brought some cupcakes. So there are cupcakes for all the students. Um, again, thank you, and that was our demonstration.
Uh, our game is called VRDology, and if it's not clear by our name, we're a VR game that is about art and archaeology. <laughs> um, our focus is on Chinese art specifically, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the SMEs and how we got to the game idea. So this is our first SME, Wei Lin. Uh, she's a professor of art history at Transylvania University, and she came to us saying that she really wanted to get college students inspired and interested in studying Chinese art history. Um, when she was really young and in China, she said it was an amazing experience to be able to go to these real sites and see these thousand-year-old artifacts. And that's not something she can really do with her students as she works in Kentucky, which is thousands of miles from China. So we talked to her and we said, I think we can do this if we did it in VR, where the students would be able to interact with real art pieces from your curriculum and be able to see and learn about what they do and how they were used during that time period. Now, along the way of development, uh, we realized it was really difficult for Wayland to be able to experience the game as she didn't have readily access to VR, as well as the fact that uh, she's in Kentucky. So we brought on another SME, Lan Lan Kuang. Now, she's a professor of philosophy at the University of Central Florida, so right down the road. Uh, so she specializes in arts and humanities of China, and along the way she's been able to come and playtest our game and give us feedback, as well as make sure that we're not doing anything culturally insensitive, since this is, in fact, a culture that none of us are really experienced with. So here's our game flow. Essentially how it works is we have four levels. Uh, in each of the levels, one through three, there's two artifacts from Wayland's curriculum that you interact with and use to solve puzzles. And then in the final level, you're going to be quizzed on that knowledge that you've gained along the way. Now, during this demo, we're only going to be showing you level one and the final level for uh, the sake of time. Um, but if you're interested, feel free to come by and play our VR demo um, at FIA. So just to show you some of the cool stuff we've done, so in the yellow is our models and our textures that the artists on our team have made. And in orange, uh, those are the real artifacts that Wayland teaches about in her class. So one of the struggles was to make sure that these artifacts looked and felt as real as possible, including the actual dimensions, um, taking into effect some of the accounts like the oracle bone where uh, there's a certain script that was used on these objects and we wanted to make sure we translated that over well to our own art in the game. So uh, Ku Wong was able to come and play test our game uh, as soon as it was finished about two days ago. And she gave us a lot of really cool feedback with our final project. Uh, she thought it was a really impressive. And she thought that we were able to reach our goal of making it educational and fun. Um, and overall, she thought it was a success and would want to play it again. Uh, she's going to be actually bringing her students in next semester and using this as part of her syllabus in her class, which is super cool. Um, we were able to send a demo video to Waylon as well, and she's going to be showing that to her students just to, to show them, hey, look, there's opportunities where you can utilize your art history skills that don't necessarily involve reading books or working in a museum. So here's our team. Uh, we have three level designers, a uh, programmer, three artists, and two producers. And I also want to give special thanks to Kay, Ed, and Jake. Um, they helped with voice acting as well as creating the original uh, rapid prototype last semester that helped inspire the idea for this game. So now we're going to go ahead and jump into the demo. <laughs> This is a bad idea. We should wait for the team to arrive. Hello? Can you hear me? Is this thing working? Yes, I can hear you. Look, Ed is trapped down here, potentially in danger. We don't have time to wait for the rest of the team. There isn't much down here considering it's the tomb of a Chinese emperor. Well, I guess there's nothing down there. I 
bronze mirror laying on the ground. Yeah, bronze mirrors were created using the bronze mold casting technique, which was popular during the Zhao dynasty. So this mirror is close to 5,000 years old. Yeah, so don't do something dumb and just throw it back on the ground. The mirror activated something. Three gongs just appeared. I would tell you not to hit them, but I know you just wouldn't listen. Oh no, I just found bones. Oh, bones in a burial tomb? Wow. Wait, there's writing on these bones. Oh, they must be oracle bones. Does it look cracked? Tiny diviners would throw them in the fire and then use the cracks on them. Apparently would tell them the future. I wonder. Cracks form a pattern between the symbols. I think it's telling me something. happening? The ground was shaking up here. The way down opened up. One step closer to rescuing Ed. You were right. This looks to be the burial chamber of the first emperor of China. Are you still there? Hello? Who dares enter sacred chamber of the eternal emperor of China? Is that... Is that a dragon? I am not a mere dragon. I am the first emperor of China, and you are trespassing my tomb. I heard that the first emperor was experimenting with ways of becoming immortal, but I thought it was just a legend. Puny mortal! Leave my tomb now before I destroy you! Wait, I'm trying to find my friend Ed. If you are speaking of the buffoon who entered my chamber, look at your right. He is one of my Terracotta soldiers now. No, Ed. You can't do this! I can't do anything. You understand nothing about ancient Chinese ways. I know more than you think. You? How can you possibly know so much about my people? What you don't know is I happen to be a scholar of ancient Chinese art. Ha! Your hubris astounds me. Let me reveal the fallacy of your claim. I will request one of my artifacts. If you offer me the correct artifact by placing it into the ding, I will let you and your friend go. But if you fail, I will destroy you like I did your friend. If it will save Ed, then I accept. Let us begin. I need an artifact with the face of an animal on it. You mean the Tauti motif? Here it is. Hmm, beginner's luck. Next artifact. Offer me an artifact of the Joy Dynasty. A bronze mirror with a gold and silver inlay. Be careful as it is nearly 5,000 years old. Present me with an artifact that was meant to replace human sacrifice. Ming-Chi, you should consider using them instead of turning innocent people into statues. Show me an artifact that is meant to be cracked or broken. An oracle bone. 
The cracks on it foretell my victory. Lastly, present me with a statue that embodies the Diana Mudra. A Buddha, as the Dhyana Mudra symbolized the meditation of Buddha. You have proven me wrong. I will allow you to leave this place so that you may spread the knowledge that you have obtained to other simple-minded mortals. Enjoy your short life while you can. <laughs> Ed! You saved me? I told you not to follow. Oh my god, you're alive! What's going on? I have Ed. Let's get out of this cursed tomb. I've had enough of Chinese art for one day. Cool, so thank you so much for watching our presentation. While we're going, they'll be setting up a little bit, and then we'll get to what they're doing. So, hi everyone. We, we are Project uh, uh, Ghost Chamber. Uh, we're a little bit different from the other projects. We worked with uh, our subject matter experts are trying to develop out a prototype. Uh, what we're trying to do is create a different kind of display than what you normally see, where we take 3D models and we try to show them in physical space, so you can you can walk around and you can see it. So, like all my favorite projects, this started with the question, wouldn't it be cool if... And so, what we were talking about at the time was mostly Iron Man. Wouldn't it be cool if we could display a model in front of us to see it in, in your face and use your, uh, use your hands to rotate it around and really get to interact with it in a way you don't normally do that? And so one part of this was pretty obvious to us. The way to interact with it via motion is through the uh, Microsoft Connect. It's, it's a very uh, easy tool to work with, well, mostly easy tool to work with. And um, it, it's really good at tracking your hand motions. And so that, that part was obvious to us. The other part is how are we going to display it? And so one thing we were thinking about is using AutoCAD. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, AutoCAD is engineering software. This, is, this allows you to take 3D models and make them very, very precise and very exact. This is used for many engineering designs, such as cars, planes, uh, roads, buildings, everything. Um, and so there are a couple of reasons we decided to use this. One, it's very exact, and so we can get our models as precise as we need them, because this is a prototype. We don't know how precise we're going to have to go. Um, and... Two, uh, it supports plugins, which means we can write our own software and integrate it in with it and get it up and running so we can uh, pull this off. The only problem we had is not many of us worked with AutoCAD, so we had to find a subject matter expert to help us out. Uh, one of our fellow Fians, Lucas, uh, recommended his father to work with us. Uh, so we contacted Kirk Nicola who is a 35-year industry professional engineer. He, is, he had a wealth of knowledge for us to pull from. Anytime we had questions, he immediately had answers for us, and he helped us uh, stay on track throughout this entire project. <clears throat> so the second half of this is how were we actually going to project it in the real world? And this is, co uh, this is called a Pepper's Ghost Illusion. So basically what you have in this picture is down in the bottom, you have someone with a projector. 
uh, they are projecting onto whatever object they want to project. That is then reflected onto a glass, uh, glass pane. And then if you look at it from the correct angle, it'll look like it's floating in front of you. It's an old magician's trick, but if you uh, work with it and do it right, you can get some really cool results. And so in a moment, we'll be showing you uh, what we've come up with throughout this semester. But before we do that, I just want to do some shout outs. First to Kirk for uh, offering us his, his advice and his help and really helping us uh, flush out these designs as we moved on. And then to Orlando's uh, Maker Lab, called, it's called Factor. This is a wonderful place. All of the parts that we've made, everything we've uh, needed, we've gone there to cut the parts and make them. They provided us training so we can use things like industry grade uh, laser cutters, CNC machines, and 3D printers. And then there's a special thank you to uh, Factor faculty Swami, who has been working with us for the last about three weeks now, almost, and almost every day. And uh, I, a lot of what we come up with uh, today is thanks to him. And then, of course, Faya for giving us the chance to do this. Okay, so I think they, are you guys almost good? Okay. So while they finish setting that up real quick, uh, we seem to have an error connecting. Um, that's that's okay. So we have we have a web page up and all that. Uh, if you guys want to make these, feel free to contact us after this project, and we will show you how to make them. And we have software ready to help you. The software is documented and. Uh, we have a GitHub, so you can pull from it and you can see our examples. The, the example comes with a lot of great, uh, a lot of great software in there that it will help jumpstart your project. Okay. You guys ready? Okay. So for the first one, oops, sorry. For the first one here, uh, we have a ghost chamber set up, and it is connected to the Microsoft Connect. This allows you to use the motion controls. For those of you that can't see it, we'll have this set up afterwards so you will be able to come down and see it up close. All right. And so we have some commands such as zooming in and out. You want to show, uh, you want to show us pan? All right. You want to stand up and back up a little bit? There you go. And then, and rotate. OK. And so this is one of our previous designs. It, um, If you can see it uh, in the chamber, it should be projecting there and looking like it's floating in space. If you're having trouble seeing it, once again, we'll be showing it afterwards for everyone to come see. OK. And now Sanjay and Martin. And so for the next one, so this is a top-down projection. Uh, it's really nice. You get really good image. But part of it is this top part that uh, really blocks your vision if you're not in the absolute correct spot. So we wanted to make it a little more accessible, a little easier to see. So we tried a bottom up projection. And we also changed up how we were controlling it a little bit. We have a phone controller that is going over a uh, Wi-Fi connection to a Raspberry Pi. And it allows a slightly different way of controlling it and letting you interact. And so I hope, hopefully some of you out there can see this a little bit better and easier. OK. OK, so that's what we've been working on this semester. Uh, and once again, you'll be able to come down and see it afterwards. 
Uh, on the team, we have Connor Hollis, our lead artist, who and our only artist, who has had some very, very difficult design uh, design constraints throughout this entire project. We have three of our programmers, uh, Sanjay, Gorov, and Martin, who have worked very hard to create a lot of the software and get it ready and to a point to where you guys can pick it up and begin developing with it. And then I am the uh, only producer on the team who has been working with the programmers and the artists and bring, uh, trying to bring this all together. Thank you. <laughs>
go. Okay. Oh, that's right. We still want the volume. My apologies. Okay. And VR should be good. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Andrew Karanikolas. I am representing Team Polyatomic. Uh, we have myself, producer, our two programmers, Jose and Plato, and our wonderful artist, Yen. So let me tell you about our game. Uh, our game, has, since the beginning, has been intended for a younger audience around middle school. And uh, we were always interested in educating, especially regarding science, physics, um, as Tom was joking earlier, we have ch changed some of those specifics uh, over the course of the semester, but um, I'll get into that. So uh, I'd like to introduce our subject matter expert, Katie Brewer. Uh, she will maybe put a word in later. And um, she has generously shared her expertise and her time and her students with us, uh, and they make wonderful play testers. And um, they've, they've given us some incredible feedback that we'll get into uh, the specifics um, a little bit later. And uh, for play testing, we made it a priority to test with our target audience uh, because this is such a um, an education-based game. And although some of us may have some experience with e with educating, um, little experience with educating via games, so it's a little bit of a, a first run for us. Um, so describing the core gameplay here, um, we have a chemical bonding themed puzzle game. Um, and so the main uh, actions that the player is engaging in are, is catching, joining, splitting, and throwing molecules and atoms. Uh, furthermore, the player will step between four quadrants on the ground that represent different groups on the periodic table. Um, so that earlier shot you saw was demonstrating the fact that we also have a, uh, a, a laser, what we call the um, tractor beam, pulling atoms in so that the player can then grab them and then combine them into the desired compound. Um, and that, that's visible there at the top where it says CO2. Player is also being timed. You are hoping for the best time that you can, and, and that's actually kept track of as well. All right. So for our educational goals, as we said, uh, we're, we're really trying to uh, just increase the, the students or the players' familiarity with uh, the terminology, relationships, and other concepts discussed in like a middle school chemistry or physics class. Um, so in order to do that, we, we needed to engage the player in visual, auditory, uh, tactile, uh, and, uh, and, and even uh, reading um, mediums. And so uh, at the bottom line, we're, we're really just trying to foster an interest in the subject matter and provide a supplement to a, a traditional curriculum. And uh, we're, we're very proud of the fact that we have scientifically accurate molecular geometry for all of the atoms and compounds in our game. And, uh, and you'll get a, a, a view of all those now. So here are the elements that we have in our game. Uh, they're separated uh, into the, the different groups that we chose. That is group 1, 14, 16, and 17 on the periodic table. So you'll see the little uh, the card, the information card, that uh, will pop up when the player presses the, the button and they are holding that compound. It'll show you exactly which element you're holding. Uh, same for the compounds. And you'll see the, this image here to the right of the, um, the S, for example. That is pulled from uh, scientific journals indicating what atoms really look like at the, you know, nanoscale. And so that's what we tried to replicate with our uh, particle effects. And here you see uh, the compounds, same deal. Geometric, um, the molecular geometry of these compounds is much different from what we typically see in a lot of textbooks where it's just a ball and a stick connected in various places. It's all three-dimensional, of course, so uh, we really had to, to think outside the box on how to represent that. Um, not to mention the fact that we have no true images of these. They're all representations because down there it's it, it too small for photons to, to reach. Therefore, we don't have any photos of these tiny uh, entities. Um, so 
So that gives you an idea of what you're, you're going to see in our demo. Um, I'd like to talk now about how important playthrough, uh, play tests have been for us. So on the 6th, we had three 8th graders from Lake Highland Prep. And they came in and, and played the game for about 45 minutes each. And um, they, they each made very useful uh, observations and comments on how we can improve our game. So for example, Penny uh, said that it was a little bit hard to remember which vortex is which. Uh, we have different ones for ionic and covalent bonds. Uh, and the player has to decide which is the right one to throw it in after they've made their molecule. Um, so to address that, we've added an electrical particle effect to the ionic vortex. Um, Sophia noticed that uh, it was easy to confuse chlorine and fluorine. They happened to be right next to each other on the periodic table and in our group. So uh, they had very similar coloration. Um, different, but apparently too similar. So we differentiated them even more. And, uh, and Gabe, he noticed that uh, elements were entering the vortex from behind, uh, even when they weren't thrown by the player, or sometimes when they were pulled by the player with the tractor beam. So we changed it so that the vortex only accepts compounds thrown by the player. And we had a similar experience the next day when uh, Fire brought in a large group of middle schoolers from a video game to um, design after school program. And we were able to test with nine of those, but it was a much faster, um, rather hectic kind of play test session because they were under a time constraint. So uh, we got a little bit more volume, less in-depth debriefing from that. But it was still very useful. For example, uh, whether because it was loud in the room or because the volume was too low, uh, they couldn't hear much of the voiceover. So specifically for the, mu the tutorial level, we muted the music. Um, there were many, many missed throws, more than I would expect. Uh, not surprising, considering that some of them were playing VR for the first time. So we increased the size of all colliders. And, uh, and it was too easy to accidentally hit the split button, the split molecule. So we remapped it to the opposite end of the trackpad that has the, uh, the tractor beam. The tractor beam is a very common button. It, your, your thumb is pretty much resting there. So on the opposite side, much less likely you're going to make a mistake like that. OK, so now we're going to get into our demo. All right, Jose. So here he, he's showing our brand new menu. You grab the level that you want to play, and you throw it into the vortex. Welcome to polyatomic. Catch, join, and split molecules to construct the indicated objective compound. Then throw it into the correct vortex. Looks like he's got a diatomic hydrogen there. That's the natural state of hydrogen throw out compounds in the world. With ionic bonds Same with diatomic vortex, oxygen. And compounds with covalent bonds into the red vortex. Step into the four quadrants to select different element groups on oh. the periodic table. And just like this that, water. The simple hydrogen will appear no matter which oh. quadrant you are standing in. H2O is formed from hydrogen and oxygen, yes. two non-metal elements. Therefore, it has a covalent bond. Okay, covalent bond. Throw it in the covalent vortex. Nice job. All right, and for our next level, these are intended to be r rather short levels. There's many elements and compounds on the periodic table, as you know. So um, now we're going to show you carbon dioxide. Standing in the yellow group, pulling in carbon. Uh, yep, there it is. So what's next? Oxygen. And there we go. That's a covalent bond. Covalent vortex. All right. And we'll show you one more level. Methane.
and you've created the basic natural gas jose nice work oh wrong one i'm gonna have to make it again it behooves the wise player to check the bond type on the card before they throw it incomplete There you go. I checked the bond. Ah, covalent. It says right there. Nice job. Okay. So that's our demo for you. Now, if our SME wants to come up and, and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. So different. I teach middle school, so I'm used to little kids. <laughs> Thank you all for having me here today. It's been it's been an incredible experience to um, see this from. I think the inception. Andrew contacted me, I believe January, we'll mm -hmm. say, thereabouts, and uh, we met briefly um, after work, and we talked through the whole experience and seeing. You know, from a teacher standpoint, seeing students so excited about a game or an idea. And then watching that idea progress from these beginning things where they were talking about moving through quadrants, that stayed that stayed the same. But um, seeing how it's changed has been really, really amazing for me. Um, I've loved working with them, and I think the level of engagement in their their drive to make things authentic was really, really, really valuable. Um, when I brought my students in into separate groups. I, I mean, their eyes were open to not only a very cool video game experience, but also a career in video games, which I obviously don't have to tell the audience here. Um, hmm. What was more re rewarding, though, was seeing their parents when they came to pick them up and watching them be able to tour the facility and see that there is a future in this. And so seeing it on so many different levels from the enjoyment with the video game designers, the players, and then the, you know, the investors for the players, we'll say, hmm. um, it's, been, it's been great. Thank so, you, Katie. Yeah. Yeah. It's been. It, yeah. Thank you. And so that's Polyatomic. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to throw out a special thank you to JT and Todd for uh, this week of uh, getting getting the word out to everybody uh, and to the SMEs. This, this class uh, has definitely been the best game lab ever, and a lot of thanks goes to the SMEs and uh, the students as well for taking it so seriously and uh, making these games certainly the best game labs games we've ever had. And uh, so thank you to everybody. And, uh, you've made a pretty high bar for the next class. Thanks. <laughs>